The hype around Rashad Bateman continues to skyrocket as the Baltimore Ravens hope for a breakout season. We talk about why, who's talking about him, and so much more coming up next on this episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire, here with you on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for being here today, making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day or free and available on all podcasting platforms and includes in video form on YouTube and audio form wherever you get your shows. Five days a week here of Ravens content. We got news, analysis, updates for you. Plus, we do bonus episodes sometimes. We got live streams after every piece of Ravens big news and after every single Ravens game. We'll be starting up here in a couple of months. Today's episode, we have a lot to talk about today. As we talked about Rashad Bateman for practically this entire offseason about how important it is for him to have a huge year. He's gotten a lot of hype and that hype continues to skyrocket. So today, we're going to be talking about who is talking about Bateman at this moment because not only have his Ravens teammates, his Ravens coaches hyped him up, but we're now starting to get some national hype from a lot of people about Bateman. So we'll talk about him, what he has to do this year, and and a lot of those expectations. Then we're going to talk a bit about a Ravens to-do list. Bleacher Report put out a to-do list, and I want to kind of kind of piggyback off of that, give my thoughts, and then what my to-do list would be. And actually, I think we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. And then we'll also talk about the AFC North because Hard Knock got me thinking, how is this division going to end up looking? And doing a little bit of a check-in on the Ravens division rival. So let's talk about Rashad Bateman, first of all. Now, who's talking about him? Well, first of all, I just said, literally, I think throughout all of OTAs, all of minicamp. We got everybody, every Ravens offensive playmaker, some of those defensive playmakers to all the coaches. They were all talking about Rashad Bateman, how important he is to the offense, how good he's looked, and just supporting him. And that's what you should be doing, right? If you're a teammate, you should be supporting your teammates. If you're a coach of a guy, you should be supporting that guy. But it was everybody. And that's a, it's a good sign. But we, we can't take that as an, oh, okay, Bateman is guaranteed to break out. Obviously, we have to see Bateman, one, stay healthy. That is the most important part of this whole equation. But two, some of the inconsistencies we have seen, particularly with Lamar Jackson and Rashad Bateman and that connection. And we've had Kadri Ismail, who's a former Ravens wide receiver, and he's been out there at minicamp and OTAs. And he talked about how there were some ups and downs for Lamar and Bateman throughout the course of the workouts where they were on the same page at times, not on the same page at others. And look, the whole point of the off season is to get that chemistry. So you know what? If the connection isn't great here in June, okay, like not ideal, but it's fine because you know what? If that connection is fine by September and moves on and is great throughout the regular season and playoffs, that's what matters. So you get all the all the negative stuff out now, get all the missed connections out now, make sure it's good by the time the season starts and you're you're all good with me there. But it ended up being Brian Baldinger, who again, we've seen a lot of people start to get on the Rashad Bateman hype train. I know there, look, there's a lot of conversation about Rashad Bateman right now. Some people are very much on that train. Other people are not. Some people are wondering, well, which, which side of that conversation should they be on? I personally am a Bateman believer, but... I, I want to see it on the field here more consistently because we've seen we've seen those tantalizing plays, that those slant route run, everything that Bateman does, but then the health hasn't been there. There's been inconsistency. So it's just about him putting it all together. Now, Brian Baldinger ended up talking about him and giving him really high praise because just they were doing a segment on the Ravens and Baldinger went out of his way and said, Quote, this guy's a tremendous route runner. He's got size. He hasn't lost any speed whatsoever. I expect him to be a big focal point of this passing game with Lamar Jackson this season. And that goes kind of hand in hand with what we've been hearing about Bateman all offseason. And again, it's one thing to hear about stuff in the offseason. It's another thing to have that actually be what happens on the field. And these past three seasons, based off of being a first-round rookie, based off of the expectations he has had and the roles he's been given, It has been a disappointment, but there is a chance for Bateman on that extension, which by the way, you look at this wide receiver market, Bateman got 6 million per season for three years. 
Let's look at the other wide receivers who signed this offseason. Gabe Davis got $13 million per season. Darno Mooney got $13 million per season. Out of those three guys, I think Bateman is by far the best value and honestly might be the best player out of those three, if we're being honest. I know some people love Gabe Davis, other people don't. But we heard Nate Wiggins talk about, you know, both Rashad Bateman and Zay Flowers, about hardest cover, most fun guy to cover. And he talked about Bateman and Flowers in that vein together. And it's just, it's been really nice to hear the stuff. It's been great. But again, we have to see it translate over. Just for reference, to put out some stats behind everything here, throughout Bateman's three seasons in the NFL, you know, it, it hasn't been amazing. I mean, his best year was his rookie season where he missed the start of his rookie year with that foot injury, if you remember. Ended up having four, or I think I think it wasn't foot, no, it was core. Was it, it was a core injury, I believe. One of the two. I can't, it's... 2021 is a long time ago, but he ended up having 46 catches, 515 yards, and a touchdown. Then in 2022, his second season, only 15 catches with 285 yards and two touchdowns. Obviously, that was a pretty big disappointment, especially with him getting injured and having to miss a lot of the season towards the back end. And then last year, he had to miss some time, but didn't miss a ton, but ended up only having 32 catches, 367 yards, and one touchdown. Now, there's a lot of this that does fall on Bateman's shoulders, but I'm not going to go as far as to blame Bateman for everything here. One, the health thing is not his fault. Injuries happen. I'm, I'm never going to blame a guy unless there is, you know, clear negligence and a guy is, is clearly neglecting health and not putting the proper work. Injuries happen in football. Practice injuries happen in football. You know, you just, you, you can't predict it. So I'm not blaming Bateman for his health. I think some people do, and I'm just, I'm trying to set the record straight that I do not. But the other part of this is I want Baltimore, and we've talked about this before, to be more of a balanced offense this season. Now, there's a couple of things that go into that, not to the point where you are neglecting your identity as a run-first team. This is a run-first team. They should have been a run-first team all season. Guess what? They were until the biggest moment of the year in the Asian Championship. But I, I digress. That's a little different of a conversation. But, you know, it doesn't really help anybody. When if your name throughout the whole Lamar Jackson tenure has been, okay, well, if your name is not Marquise Brown, Mark Andrews, or Zay Flowers, you're probably getting like two targets a game, three, four, five, and, and that's it. Or I guess Isaiah likely when Mark Andrews goes down, right? I think Lamar, for him, sometimes he can be a little hyper-focused on one guy. I think as you know, Andrews went down and likely came in, he got a lot better at spreading that football around. But the Ravens, again, were 30th in passing attempts last season, and they were first in rushing attempts. They should be, at the very least, a top three rushing team in terms of attempts in the NFL. That is their identity. They need to feed into that identity. But I think that it would help Bateman and help all the other guys as well if there was just more established as a passing offense. I think that's what they brought Todd Munkin in to do. I think last year was more of that transitional period. We talked about that and what Steve Young had to say about that during an appearance on uh, this show, this is football, but I do think it would benefit Bateman to get more targets, more opportunities, more ability to, you know, just go out there and produce and get into a rhythm because it, I'm sure it's probably hard to go out there and, you know, only, you know, you're running all these routes and we see him get open I and mean, you can watch the tape. Bateman is a really good route runner. I think flowers, Zay flowers is the best route runner on this team, but it is actually closer than you think between him and Rashad Bateman because you want to go back and watch his college tape, you can. Bateman absolutely cooked dudes in college in Minnesota. I mean, even go watch the Ravens tape. Like, if you want to watch his Ravens highlights and some of the stuff he can do as a route runner or even the throws where Lamar doesn't see him or Lamar doesn't get the ball to him the right way or, just, you know, he drops it, whatever, Bateman is a good route runner. And I think having Flowers and Bateman, if those two are click on, clicking on all cylinders – it just it makes this Ravens offense so, so, so much more dangerous. And plus, they just need Bateman this season. Like, they are taking a risk in trusting him as the wide receiver, too. I use this example all the time. If you're in every day, you're probably sick of me saying it. But back in 2022, when they essentially, after Bateman came off that rookie season, and they said, you're the number one receiver, they shouldn't have done that. And I was very vocal about that at the time. I've been very vocal about it, you know, since it happened. This is a little bit of a different situation because you have Zay Flowers as your number one, but they didn't bring in competition for Bateman for that number two spot. 
Nelson Aguilar is a clear cut number three. Tez Walker, I think at this point is a clear cut number four. That's not okay. You can challenge Bateman last year with a lot of the Odo Beckham stuff. We were wondering a lot of the season who was number two, who was number three. I think that flip flopped and Bateman was probably like, Oh, well, okay. Like, and what's my role? Am I going to be the number two? Am I the number three? And again, at the end of the day, does that really matter that much? Like if you're on the field, you're on the field. If you're not, if you're not, it's not really a matter of who is the number one receiver, number two, number three. But I think that did cut into his snaps. And at this point, honestly, if we are being honest here, I think Baltimore is just saying we want to see what we have in our young guys. We want to give these guys roles and figure it out. It's a, it's a transitional year. It's a year where it's <laughs> – I call it the year of the replacement plans because that is what Baltimore's had. And now they're unleashing all of that seemingly at once. And Bateman, I think, not that he's replacing Odell or anything like that because Beckham didn't really have the year, but he thought he would at least up to the contract standards. But he's he's going in there and he is their clear-cut number two guy. But a lot of hype surrounding him that continues to skyrocket. So, again, there's a difference between getting hype in the offseason and actually putting it on the field in the regular season, I think. A lot of people have been burned by that, myself included, far too many times. So I'm not going to get really ahead of myself at all here. But again, it's better than him having, you know, all this negative stuff around him and he's struggling and all that. Seems like things are going according to plan, but it has to keep that way and obviously has to transit over the regular season. Coming up, though, in the second part of the show, we'll talk about a Ravens to-do list as we head in to training camp in a month. Stay tuned. We've got a lot to get to here on Lockdown Ravens. First, the show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience of formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level up speed performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether they're in the speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has it covered. With over 120 million parts, your number one ride or die always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Here's with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. All the parts you need, the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep around or die live at ebaymotors.com. As always, always to apply eBay Grandy Fit only available to U.S. customers. We're back. Our second segment of Locked on Ravens here on Purple Friday. Kevin Ostriker, your host, still here with you. Again, really appreciate you making Locked on Ravens a part of your day today as we head in to the weekend. Hopefully everybody has some fun weekend activities planned. Also, be sure to check out Peter Bukowski on Locked on Sports today. Here on the Locked On Podcast Network, you're at some everyday Peter takes you throughout the entire sports world. So not just football, all the sports world. He does a great job at us. Be sure to check out Peter over there on Locked On Sports today. Now, we're actually less than a month now. Today's Friday, June 21st. The Ravens report on July 20th. So less than a month until the Veterans Report to Ravens training camp. We're, we're getting closer, everybody. I promise. I know it's been it's been a long offseason, especially after how the season ended last year. But we are getting closer and closer to Ravens football. So if you want to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel here in video form, follow along and subscribe in audio form. We'd really appreciate that. We do this five days a week and we're here for you, even in the low periods of the off season. This is, you know, I've been on a crazy streak. I believe this is going to be episode 1,275 consecutive for me. Got to check that, but the official number coming up on 1,300. So we always are here for you five days a week on locked on Ravens. Now with that being said, the Ravens do have less than a month, about you know 29-ish days, 30 days, to figure out how they're going to maneuver throughout the rest of this lull period before training camp. What should they be doing? Should they make any other moves, add anybody? Well, Bleacher Report put out a to-do list for every team, and I wanted to, first of all, I'll read out what they put, but I wanted to kind of give my own thoughts on what I think they should do, which, again, I think we'll be talking about this particular thing a little bit later in the week, just a more extensive, like this is going to be not as extensive. We're going to be doing a much more extensive to-do list for the Ravens sometime next week, I believe. But then also just about guys who they could potentially sign. So we'll talk about Baltimore's for Bleacher Report here. So uh, let's see. Shout out to Matt Holder for this. But number one, at a right tackle, Matt says here. Uh, I'm not going to read out the entire thing, but essentially – Matt says that Roger Rosengarten was viewed more as, as a swing tackle by the BR scouting department. Um, so they're just saying, bring in another guy that can compete for the job, essentially trade for Matt Judon. Number two uh, ends up saying that it'd be interesting to see his career come full circle and the team's defense could use the services. Number three, sign a linebacker with Patrick queen gone. 
uh, saying that Trenton Simpson scheduled to start next to Roquan, but he's unproven. So I'll, just, I'll briefly go over what they said, and then I'll give my own to-do list here. Uh, adding a right tackle, it just it depends on who's available. And at this point, I don't think there's anybody that would really move the needle for me. I think that competition is going to come down to Roger Rosengarten and Daniel Falele. Now, that is a lot of an experience. I know Falele is entering year three. Rosengarten's a rookie. But it feels like Rosengarten is, is NFL ready. And are there going to be some hiccups, some ups and downs? Yeah, sure, absolutely there will be. But it's about allocation of resources, which we'll talk about with that final point. And the Ravens have about five to six-ish million dollars in cap space to spend right now. Offensive line depth is great. You can literally never have enough of it. And we know that that position, especially for the Ravens, is going to be a big one to be able to protect Lamar. But I think that they're pretty content with Rosengarten and Falele competing for that. You can maybe even throw a Josh Jones or Patrick McCarry in there if you really wanted to. But I, I, th I think they're okay. I, I understand that there's not a ton of experience there. But again, I think that's just what Baltimore is going with here. It's the year of replacement plans, the year of the young guys. And that's one of their positions where, yeah, I, th I think that's exactly what they're doing. Trade for Matthew Judon. I wouldn't hate it. I don't think his deal is, you know, his deal is not super expensive compared to some of the other edge rushers. And Judon was, you know, he was injured last year, but was very, very productive for New England over those first two seasons he was there. So, Look, I think it's another more of the replacement plans. David Ajabo coming in, and you know, you can even talk about maybe Atavius Robinson replacing a guy like Shadavian Clowney. Kyle Van Noy is back. Adafi always expected to take a big leap this season, but outside of those two, it is going to be a lot of hey, can you prove to this team that you can be a guy in Ajabo and Robinson? So I definitely am not opposed to them adding another edge rusher. I think it's already kind of dicey because I don't think Malik Cam makes this roster unless he has a crazy, crazy, crazy training camp in preseason. I just don't think there's enough room on the roster. I mentioned Van Noy, Owe, Ajabo, Robinson, and then Adisa Isaac, who he's a third round pick. You're not cutting him. I mean, that's five already. And I project them to keep five guys. That leaves Malik Cam on the outside looking in. Even if they keep six, okay, let's say they add a vet. Well, it's going to be that vet probably. And then Ham's on the outside looking. And so there, there's an abundance of depth and talent there. Some unproven for sure. But look, Judon's a guy that would certainly move a needle. And I don't think it costs a crazy amount of draft capital. Plus, we have to remember this. The Ravens are in line for four comp picks next season. They can afford to part with a mid-round pick for somebody. Like, again, it has to make sense financially, fit-wise, whatever. But I get that a lot of this, you know, post-Lamar Jackson contract, bunch of big deals and everything, it's about hitting on your draft picks and having an abundance of those and hitting on your veteran signings that, you know, pretty much like that min deals. But look, the Ravens, I literally think they're in line to have 10 or 11 draft picks that's probably, even for what Baltimore needs, that's probably too big of a draft class for them. I think that we will see draft capital be moved in some way, shape, or form, whether that is offseason, during the season, or even maybe next draft cycle during the draft when they maybe consolidate some of those picks. But we will see how that unfolds. And then signing a linebacker, I, I, don't, I don't think this is going to happen here. I think the Ravens are very content with Trenton Simpson, and they should be. He's looked great by all accounts. I also think they they like what Malik Harrison brings to the table. I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be shocked if he and Trenton Simpson's I don't want to call it a 50-50 split, but I wouldn't be shocked if they split some time to start the season. And then uh maybe Simpson kind of takes a hold over that as the season goes on because we know the Ravens with some of these young players do like to add, you know, just a veteran presence in there. So we'll see. But then you also have guys like Josh Ross, they brought back Chris Board, they lose Delshawn Phillips, but that's more of a special teams aspect of things. So I think that adding a linebacker, plus again, there's just, there's not a guy that moves the needle for me. And I think Simpson does more than enough, especially because the Ravens don't have to use Simpson in, in all the packages next season. Like with Patrick Queen, you wanted to have him on the field as much as possible, despite, <laughs> despite all the conversation that's going on about him right now, you wanted to have him and Roquan together, but there's just, there's not that need right now. Now, if Simpson plays, you know, to that standard, then yeah, for sure. Get them on the field as much as you can. But to start the season, I don't think there's going to be that, and they'll be able to use positional flexibility and not just kind of 
force their way into using two linebackers all the time. Now, in terms of my offseason to-do list, I, I can get on board behind the, the Matthew Judon slash edge thing for sure. But I'd probably put that right where Matt has it here at number two. For me at number one, it is safety depth. Sign some safety depth. Bring in some safety depth. Any way, shape, or form. This is not me discounting the younger players, such as Ardarius Washington, Snoozy Kane, or you know even a Bo Braid. But I do think it would just add stability to that room. I've talked about it a lot this week. I've talked about it a lot this month, ever since the draft ended. It just it would make me feel a little better. I think it make a lot of people feel a little better if Marcus Williams or Kyle Hamilton were to go down with an injury, depending on the skill set they do bring in. They dabble with Jamal Adams. Nothing imminent there, it looks like. But again, you have guys like Justin Simmons out there, Adams himself. There are a couple of other really solid playmakers as well. So I, if I were the Ravens, I would add some safety depth. And there are still some quality guys out there because teams also, three safety rotations are huge in today's game. And I think Simmons would give you an incredible three safety rotation. Now he deserves to start somewhere and have a full-time role. Like, him coming to Baltimore would be more of, a, okay, they're going to use three safeties a lot because Simmons, again, deserves a role. But in my opinion, I think that to me would be like my top of the top to-do list. Number two, again, we can, we'll can we go with the edge thing. Number three, I mean, I get let's, let's go fun. Let's go bold. I would say trade for a number two guy, kind of going back to Bateman in the first part of the show. Someone that, again, I think it's it's good for the Ravens if they were to do that. My dream for this team this offseason was Cortland Sutton. It always had been Cortland Sutton. Doesn't seem like they're going to go that route. Just Denver doesn't really seem interested. But it feels like Baltimore's not either. There's Look, on the free agent market right now, the only guy who you could say who could slot in is maybe number two slash number three. He'd probably be number three, if we're being honest, is Michael Thomas, former Saints wide receiver. He's probably that guy. But I'm not prioritizing that over edge or over uh, safety for me. I just think, again, if, if we're going to have some fun with it here, do a little fun point of this do list, yeah, sure, why not? Can't hurt. I think Thomas, you know, people talk about the Ravens signing these veteran washed up guys and this, that, and the other. It's, it's a risk because we kind of went down this conversation for years with Julio Jones about, okay, he's a great player, but you have to account for missed games. We talked about that with Sammy Watkins when he was signed, and that was even like when he was on the downturn of his career. But yeah, I think if you sign Michael Thomas, you got to account for some missed games. But we'll see. I don't think they make that move, but hey, you know what? If they did, I, I wouldn't be totally mad at it there. Coming up in the final part of the show, we'll talk about some AFC North talk, do a little bit of a, a whip around, talking about the Bengals, the Browns, and of course the Steelers. Stay tuned, plenty to talk about here on the show. We're back, our final segment of Locked on Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still here with you on this Friday episode. Again, be sure to like and subscribe here, video form and audio form. It's the same show, both audio and video, so you're not missing out on any content anyway you are consuming our show. If you're an everyday, I really appreciate you tuning in each and every day. It means a lot to me here. If you're new to the channel, new to the show, welcome in. Hopefully you're enjoying the content, and if you are not subscribed yet, be sure to do so, whether you want to watch in video form or listen in audio form. And also, if you're somewhere in the middle, maybe you're back for your second time or you're back after a month or so, welcome back to the show. It's been a really cool building this community, video form, audio form, social media, where you can follow me over on Twitter or Instagram at ChaosStriker34, and obviously the subtech community as well. We're going to keep going strong here. We're adding some new features as the season progresses and we get closer to it. So really appreciate everybody for all the support. Now, AFC North going to be an absolute, I, I think is going to be a fight towards the end here. Obviously hard knocks and HBO certainly thinks that with everything they're doing with the in season hard knocks, Ravens, Bengals, Browns, Steelers, all on that as they, they document the final six weeks of the AFC North race, but let's just do a little check-in. We haven't done it. I don't really know if we've done it all off season, honestly, just about what's going on in the AFC North world. We know what happened with Baltimore's off season. Let's start with Pittsburgh. We know their quarterback situation is going to be different with Russell Wilson and with Justin Fields. Can he pick it no longer there? He is now in Philadelphia. The Steelers to me, and obviously look, we know Patrick Queen is there. Deshaun Elliott is there. Anthony Avert is there. Their wide receiver position to me is the worst in the league. If we're being honest, George Pickens is, you know, he's great when everything is going well for him. But other than that, they have quite literally nobody like it's Roman Wilson and a bunch of other guys. So Wide receiver room for them scares me, which is, I mean, I guess a good thing for the Ravens, but 
they they need just competent quarterback play. Like if they get competent quarterback play, I think they're going to be so much better than they were last season. We know that Lamar's kryptonite has been the Steelers, right? Everybody has it. Lamar's kryptonite, it's been the Steelers in terms of that defense. That defense has had his number. In, in fact, I wouldn't necessarily call it fun. Lamar Jackson has never played two games against the Steelers in his entire career starting. He hasn't. He's, he's either missed one. I don't know if he's missed both ever, but – he has missed at least one of the Pittsburgh games every single season over the course of his starting career. So hopefully that changes in 2024 and hopefully he can get their number and give a nice little sweep to Pittsburgh. But the defense is always going to be great. I mean, especially when you got guys like TJ Watt on that defense, making this Patrick Cam Hayward. But this Ravens offense to me is much, much, much more high powered than Pittsburgh's, even if you factor in the quarterback change. The defense is, I think Baltimore's a little better than Pittsburgh. And again, we're going to see how everybody gels, but Baltimore had a historic defense last season. Didn't lose any of their, you know, core four guys, if you want to call them that. So I, th- I think that for the Ravens, I still favor them over Pittsburgh, but we know that those games are just like 17 to 13 slugfests every single time. And, and you know, we know that Baltimore, I think what, they're one in seven, one in eight over the last eight and nine games against Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh's been beating them and you got to, you know, you got to admit that, you got to acknowledge it, but hopefully that changes this year. For the Ravens, for the Bengals side of things, we know it's kind of the other side, right? Lamar Jackson loves playing the Bengals. Joe Burrow hates playing the Ravens is is what goes on there. Burrow obviously got injured against Baltimore last year on Thursday night football, which ended up ending his season. They've been going through a bunch of disgruntled things with both Jamar Chase and T Higgins. I think this is T Higgins last year in Cincinnati. My bull prediction. And I, I think I said this maybe here or on the NFL show, maybe the Ryan Ripton show too. I can't remember. But I think T. Higgins goes to Buffalo next season with Josh Allen. Just just a hunch. Just a hunch after they traded Stephon Diggs away. And it's more of a, uh, you know, more of a, I don't want to say transitional year because I still expect him to compete. But wide receiver room right now is interesting over there in Buffalo. But regardless, Cincinnati's offseason was interesting. They lost DJ Reader, who was one of those guys who gave Tara Linderbaum fits on the interior. They replaced him with Sheldon Rankins, who the Ravens saw in the AC divisional round against Houston. They replaced Joe Mixon with Zach Moss. I think Zach Moss is a better fit for their system. I do think Mixon is a little bit better of a player, but I think, again, system fit does mean something. And I I do think Moss, especially with his savvy and pass protection, should at least be an upgrade there for them. But I, 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 it's tough. I mean, it's a push, but I probably would have kept Mixon if I were them. They drafted Amarius Mims in the first round. I loved Amarius Mims as a prospect, but he's probably not going to start for them next season because they already have Orlando Brown Jr. and they signed Trent Brown. So they have two monsters on their offensive line already, the tackle spots, and Mims doesn't really project in to play guard. So I don't think he starts for them. And that, look, first round picks are valuable, and Mims has pro bowl, all pro potential, but to not have your first round pick play meaningful snaps unless an injury happens or a benching happens, that is a pretty big blow to a team that's expected to contend. So that's tough. I mean, obviously a lot of the, a lot of the conversation points to their secondary, you know, stone is there. I think they needed a safety and look stone, I think will be good over there, but he's, he's a guy that they, they have a lot of questions. They brought back Von Bell, who was a big piece for them a couple of seasons ago. Obviously, Jesse Bates left last season, so they've, they've kind of been working through their situation. Dax Hill has been not wonderful for them for the most part. So it's going to depend on, again, if Burrow can get back to being Joe Burrow when he's at his best, if the receivers can stay healthy, and if that defense can take a step forward, I think. But now for Cleveland, I mean, this all hinges on Deshaun Watson. Watson obviously led that incredible comeback. And look, we can acknowledge that, look, he went 13 for 13 with the broken shoulder and he, he ripped that game away from the Ravens. The Ravens didn't want it badly enough. The Browns did. And Deshaun Watson was a catalyst in that, but Sean Watson has been so, so disappointing since he got there. I mean, look, can Deshaun Watson be Houston to Sean Watson? We've been asking that now for the past two going on three seasons and he's looked nowhere close with, the deal they gave them, but the draft capital they gave up, it's looking like one of the worst trades in NFL history, considering with the success or I guess lack of it they've had. Nick Chubb will be back at some point. That's a big boost. They bring in Jerry Judy. Their defense obviously is incredibly elite. So it's about the offense for them. They can be such a good team, but 
I just, I don't think I believe in Deshaun Watson. I have to see it to believe it because he was incredible in it when he was in Houston on the field, but it has just been an utter disaster when you talk about suspension and just everything that happened with Watson. So it, it all depends. Again, Lamar Jackson and obviously Mark Andrews too. Those two have a lot of success against Cleveland as well, but they've had their number a couple times too. So Pittsburgh's had their number a ton. Cleveland, the second most amount, and then Cincinnati really has not had any answer for Lamar Jackson over the course of his career. But the North, again, I expect it to be very competitive. Would not be shocked if all the teams finish with a winning record and three teams probably again in the playoffs if that ends up happening, which again, would not be shocked about either. That's all I have for you today, although I'm locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. Coming up, we'll be back here on Monday after a two-day break talking more Ravens. So be sure to stay tuned for that. I'll see you right back here on Monday on Lockdown Ravens.